I am currently joined by Dr. Peter Hayes of the University of Sunderland. He is a history lecturer, senior lecturer, sorry, uh, if, that, if that is correct, if you don't mind. Uh, politics and history. Politics and history. Yeah. And we are going to be talking about Scott Joplin. Well, I say we. It's not something I know about, should I say. But it is something that I believe you know quite a lot about, Mr. Hayes. That's right. Yep. Too right. <laughs> So where do we, where do we start? What's what's where where's the beginning for Mr. Scott Job? Well, I think we should start by hearing a little bit of his music. I've called this talk uh, Scott Joplin: The Sunderland Connection. Now, Scott Joplin, known as the King of Ragtime, was born in about 1868 and died in 1917. He grew up in Texarkana on the Texas-Arkansas border. From the time he was a teenager, Joplin travelled widely in the South and the Midwest. He settled for a time in Sedalia and then in St. Louis, Missouri, and ended his life in New York. Sunderland, as our listeners know, is a city by the sea in northeast England. It's a rather nice place. It has a two-mile-long sandy beach and an ancient church where the venerable Bede once lived. Still, for all Sunderland's charms, Scott Joplin never went there. Indeed, as far as we know, he never left the United States. Nonetheless... An event that occurred in Sunderland in 1898 was to have a fateful and decisive impact on Scott Joplin's life. My name is Peter Hayes. I'm a politics lecturer at Sunderland University, where I teach on the Politics and History BA programme. In this podcast, I will explain this Sunderland connection with Scott Joplin and explore how the great ragtime composer responded to the political and social circumstances in America in the late 19th and early 20th century. The story I tell is put together from writings on Joplin and his era, particularly books by Rudy Blesch and Harriet Janis and by Edward Berlin, and from newspaper articles from the time when Joplin lived. And all of the music you hear in the background is music by Joplin. Joplin had an unusual, rather surprising life story because he made some surprising choices. First, it was ragtime that had made Scott Joplin famous, but he didn't especially want to be known as the King of Ragtime, but rather as an opera composer. Second, Joplin influenced the early jazz composers and was highly admired by them. But Joplin rejected jazz. Third, Joplin made much of his income playing the piano in brothels, but became what we would call now a feminist. Well, by understanding the Sunderland connection, these puzzling aspects of Joplin's life fall into place. Joplin's father Giles had been a slave until freed in the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 and he then became a farm worker. Joplin's mother Florence, a free-born black woman from Kentucky, did domestic work. His parents were poor, but young Scott was able to get access to a piano in the home of a white family that employed his mother. Seeing his talent, a Texarkana piano teacher, Julian Weiss, originally from Germany, gave him piano lessons for free. In his teens, Joplin left home to become an itinerant pianist in bars, dance halls, work camps and bordellos. But he was back in Texarkana as a young man in 1891 and became involved in an affair that showed some of the tension that existed between whites and blacks. White veterans of the Southern Confederate Army organised a benefit night to raise money to erect a statue of Jefferson Davis, who was the President of the South during the Civil War. Not knowing what the night was for, a recently formed group of black musicians called the Texarkana Minstrels, which included Joplin, agreed to provide the music. Confederate statues have been controversial in the United States, and not just in the 19th century. In 2017, there were violent clashes in Charlottesville, North Carolina, over statues to Jefferson Davis and others. A woman was killed, and President Trump uh, offered his views. Well, back in 1891, the Texarkana minstrels were slated in the black press for not pulling out of the benefit. The papers named and shamed each member, which is why we know that Joplin was involved. Scott Joplin learned from this experience and was more careful about these things in the future. Like many pianists, Joplin attended the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, where ragtime music was in the air. And then, in the mid-1890s, he went to Sedalia, Missouri and enrolled in the George R. Smith College to study music. In 1899, while still living in Sedalia, he published his first two rags, Original Rags and the Maple Leaf Rag. The Maple Leaf Rag made Scott Joplin famous. It sold over a million copies. And luckily, Joplin had sold it on a royalty basis, 
so that from then on his continuing success provided him with a modest income. He quickly published several more rags and became known as the King of Ragtime. In 1901, Joplin moved to St. Louis, to the edge of the Red Light District, or Sporting District. Black musicians could earn excellent money here, and ragtime players from all over the country converged on the city. It was in St. Louis in 1901 that Joplin had a fateful experience, one that gave a new direction to his creative endeavours, and it is here that the Sunderland Connection comes in. Today, Sunderland has a superb Edwardian theatre, the Empire Theatre, built in the time. Uh, but in the time of Scott Joplin, uh, it had another superb theatre, the Victoria Hall at the edge of Mowbray Park. Sadly, this theatre is gone. It was destroyed by a bomb in the Second World War. And it's now chiefly remembered as the site of a terrible disaster in 1883, when an audience of children at a magic show ran to get sweets from the stage and were crushed to death on the stairs. This appalling tragedy has somewhat overshadowed an important musical event that took place at the hall on the 16th of November, 1898. This was the first public performance of Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. There had been a great deal of pre-concert hype about this work. At a small private performance in London, crowds of people had turned up to try, unsuccessfully, to get in. So this first public performance, in a major venue, was eagerly awaited. It attracted a large audience and the national press and was a huge success. The Sunderland performance drew international attention to Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha. One person who learned of it was the director of the St. Louis Choral Society, Professor Alfred Ernst. Ernst had come to St. Louis in 1894 after a European career that included translating Richard Wagner's opera Die Meistersinger into French. He purchased the score to Hiawatha and performed it in St. Louis in 1900. There's nothing out of the ordinary about this, of course, until it is remembered that in a period when race relations in the United States were very fraught, Ernst and his choral society were white and Coleridge Taylor was black. This performance by white classical musicians in St. Louis of a work of a black man occurred at a time of hardening social segregation between whites and blacks. The crude racist stereotyping of black people was lacking in culture and sophistication, and in some areas, a vicious determination to keep black people in their place. For instance, to stage a work by a black composer was, therefore, a kind of public repudiation of the social division between white and black, as well as of the stereotyping and oppression of black people. It was not, therefore, simply a musical performance, but also a social and political statement. Through this performance, Alfred Ernst got to know Scott Joplin. He recognised Joplin's genius and shared his experience of opera music with him. Two articles in the white press describe the friendship between the musicians. The fullest is found in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 1901, where Ernst describes playing Wagner to Joplin. Recently, says Professor Ernst, I played for him portions of Tannhauser. He was enraptured. I could see that he comprehended and appreciated this class of music. It was the opening of a new world to him, and I believe he felt as Keats felt when he first read Chapman's Homer. Ernst's words are easily misunderstood as being patronising. There is little doubt that Joplin was already familiar with classical music, and quite probably with Wagner, at least in pianic transcription. Joplin, we should remember, had studied music at the George R. Smith College, and classical music was not at all confined to the white world in the United States at that time. To understand what had enraptured Joplin, let us go back to Ernst's comparison between Joplin and the feelings of John Keats after reading George Chapman's translation of Homer. Keats describes these feelings in his famous poem. Then I felt like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when, with eagle eyes, he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Earlier in this poem, Keats explains that he is in fact already familiar with the Greek myths, but when he reads Chapman's translation of Homer, he sees them in a new way. Well, just as Keats already knows Homer's tales, but discovers them afresh in this translation, so Joplin, who already knows of classical music, only now understands its social and political possibilities. This, I think, is what had enraptured Joplin. With Ernst's help, Joplin had gained a vision of what he might achieve if he used his abilities to create music with a transformative power. Coleridge Taylor and his Sunderland performance was a part of Joplin's inspiration. 
he was black and had gained recognition for an extended work of classical music. And so could Joplin. And Wagner was an inspiration too. Wagner's music is part of a hugely ambitious project to create new myths and challenge conventional morality for its German audience. Without in any way adopting Wagner's view of the world, Joplin seized on the idea of opera as a vehicle of social transformation for a whole people, in Joplin's case, for black people. Armed with this new purpose, Joplin's attitude to music changed. Ragtime, for Joplin, became classic ragtime. And ragtime was not all he was going to write. He was going to write opera. By 1903, the first opera was written. On the 22nd of August of that year, uh, the Blackman newspaper, the Sedalia Weekly Conservator, reported, Scott Joplin's opera is rehearsing daily at Crawford's Theatre. The title is a guest of honour. Joplin is backed by a strong capitalist who for many years has been manager and proprietor of several well-known high-class operas, White. This being his first adventure into Negro opera. They opened the season at East St. Louis, August the 30th, then five engagements at Sedalia. His opera is entirely his original composition, including songs and drills. At this point, I wish I had some music from a guest of honour to share with you. Unfortunately, I don't, because the opera is lost. Years later, when Joplin's wife Lottie was asked about it, she said she thought he might have left it in a suitcase in a boarding house in Pittsburgh. We also have no clue as to what the opera was about. In October 1901, President Theodore Roosevelt invited the black educationalist and statesman Booker T. Washington to the White House, and it's been guessed that perhaps Washington was the guest of honour in the opera, but nobody knows. As for the melodies, the best we can do is hear a piece called The Ragtime Dance. It's playing in the background now. This piece, which was published in 1902, augmented piano music with songs and dance steps and may have been a kind of practice run for the opera. Although Scott Joplin had left Sedalia for St. Louis, he frequently travelled back there and his name turns up several times in its local press. I've got an example here, one that helps us to understand the social and political context in which Joplin lived and worked. I'm looking at the front page of the Sedalia Weekly Conservatory for the week of the 30th of July to the 5th of August, 1904. Right in the middle of this page, there is an advert for the institution where Joplin had studied music. The George R. Smith College, it says, a high-grade Christian school, thorough instruction, expenses low. Then. In the left-hand column, we hear news of Scott Joplin under the title, What They Say of Scott Joplin. Well, they say all kinds of good things. The St. Louis Globe Democrat says Scott Joplin is the king of magtime music writers. The Chicago American says only experienced musicians can play Joplin's wonderful syncopes. The New York, New York World says Scott Joplin is the most gifted composer of his race and stands in a class by himself as a composer and writer of the American syncopated music known as as ragtime. Syncopated music is music with the melodic emphasis of the beat. According to Joplin himself, that's why it's called ragtime. The melody is ragged. Sometimes ragtime is called jagtime. You can see the same idea in this word. The melody is jagged, irregular, uneven. And despite the widespread view of the word jazz originating in a vulgar sexual word, I think that we, ha we actually see here a far more likely evolution of the term jazz. Ragtime, jag time, jazz time. Well, who knows? We will come back to the relationship between ragtime and jazz, but I want to keep looking at the paper. Below the item about the growing fame of Scott Joplin is a horrific piece of news. Under the heading, Again It Happens, the article refers to a lynching. Recently at Uteville, South Carolina, drunken Negro Ket Bookard became involved in a quarrel with some young white men, the paper says. He was arrested and fined five dollars, and being unable to pay the fine, was put in the jail to serve 15 days. That night, these young white men took Bocard from the jail and carried him to the riverbank, bound hound and foot, where they mutilated his body beyond recognition, and then tied a stone to his neck and threw him in the river. Southern manhood asserting itself. The aftermath of Bookard's murder was unusual in that there was an effort to bring his killers to justice. After his body was recovered from the river, showing the marks of prolonged and unspeakable torture, five men were put on trial for his murder. The trial lasted two days, in the course of which Bookard's wife explained, reluctantly, 
that one of her husband's killers had raped his sister, and that this may have had to do with his quarrel with the men. At the end of the trial, the jury deliberated for 16 minutes and acquitted all of them. According to figures compiled by Tuskegee University, the university founded by Booker T. Washington, Ket Bookard, murdered for trying to stand up for his sister, was one of 74 black people to be lynched in 1904. Let us turn to something less grim. Black people have celebrated the 4th of August as Emancipation Day, and with this date coming up, there were major celebrations planned in Sedalia. In the middle of the page we read, the official bulletin of the greatest 4th of August, greater than all its predecessors, amusements and attractions at Liberty Park, Sedalia, Missouri. It sounds like hyperbole, but when you look at the programme, it really does look like something special. In fact, if I could go back in a time machine, Sedalia during this 4th of August celebration is definitely on my list of places to, to visit. Beneath the title, there follows a day-long programme, with bands in the morning and speeches in the afternoon. One of these speeches is by ex-congressman George H. White. Between the end of the Civil War and the start of the 20th century, 22 blacks were elected as congressmen before the Jim Crow laws and intimidation that disenfranchised black people made it impossible for black politicians to gain national elected office. George H. White was the very last of these black congressmen to hold office. His term ended in 1901, and he did not seek re-election. It would have been pointless. White was a superb orator, and when he left the House of Representatives, he made a historic speech to Congress. In the congressional record, the speech shines out all the more by being immediately preceded by some vile racist ramblings from his fellow congressmen. The speech is still known today, in part because of a passage in which White seems to prophesize the presidency of Barack Obama. But it is the passages of the speech in which he explains the situation facing black people in 1904 that helps us to understand the kind of society in which Joplin lived and worked. White enumerated and quantified some of the achievements of black people in the 35 years since emancipation. He said, We have 32,000 teachers in the schools of the country. We have built, with the aid of our friends, about 20,000 churches and support seven colleges, 17 academies, 50 high schools, five law schools, five medical schools, and 25 theological semin seminaries, and so on. But, White continued, all this we have done under the most adverse circumstances. We have done it in the face of lynching, burning at the stake, with the humiliation of Jim Crow cars, the disenfranchisement of our male citizens, slander and degradation of our women, with the factories closed against us. Here, White listed the trades where union closed shops had prevented blacks from gaining employment. He said carpenters, painters, brickmasons, machinists, and so on. White concluded that after 35 years of struggling against almost insurmountable odds, under conditions but little removed from slavery itself, black people ask for a fair and just judgment, not of those whose prejudice has endeavoured to forestall, to frustrate his every forward movement, rather those who have lent a helping hand, that he might demonstrate the truth of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. White's eloquent speech makes obvious the tremendous difficulties faced by black people trying to make an honest living. And in this context, we can address the slightly awkward question of why Joplin chose to make a living playing the piano in brothels. From everything that is known of his character, this is a puzzle. Joplin is invariably described as reserved, respectable, proper in his speech and dress. But the answer is simple. In the deeply discriminatory United States, it was about the only place where a highly skilled, highly creative black musician could find employment that rewarded his abilities. At the foot of the advertisement for the Emancipation Day celebrations, we read about the evening's entertainment in the 4th of August Music High. 8.30pm, Scott Joplin, assisted by others, will make this programme one of the most interesting features of the celebration. To which is added in parentheses, see programme in City Dailies. But the programme in the City Dailies, which were white-run newspapers, had got an important detail wrong, and Scott Joplin had to publish a correction. Joplin was taking advantage of visiting Sedalia to make two performances, both of which were being advertised. And perhaps somebody had thought that if the performance of the Emancipation Day celebration was for blacks, well then, the other one must be for whites. But this reasoning was false. By a misunderstanding, the correction reads, one of the local dailies advertised the Scott Joplin Musicale for whites only. 
Mr Joplin wishes to state that it was an error and should have read instead, White Friends Invited. Since the imbroglio of the Jefferson Davis benefit concert, Joplin's attitude had matured. He was perfectly willing to be friendly with white people. He was friends with Professor Ernst. He was on good terms with his white publisher, John Stark, and he was friends with a number of white musicians. But insofar as he was able, Joplin would have no truck with racist segregation. His musical performances had become politicised. Joplin's politicisation is also evident in his insistence that ragtime was classic ragtime. This designation was aimed at not just the detractors of the music, but also at those who have belittled the achievements of black culture more generally to justify discrimination. The term classic ragtime was therefore an affirmation of the value not only of the music, but also of the black folk music from which it drew inspiration. Other composers also adopted the label classic ragtime, including James Scott and Artie Matthews. And by calling it classic ragtime, they meant that it was quite different from the newly emerging music of jazz. In 1921, James Scott titled one of his pieces, Don't Jazz Me Rag. I'm music. Artie Matthews would write on his pieces, Don't fake it, which suggests don't jazz it up. And when late in his life, Matthews was tracked down by jazz enthusiasts and asked to play his old tunes, he refused. He would only play Bach, he said. If Scott Joplin and other leading ragtime composers viewed their work as a form of classical music, what then is its relationship to jazz? To explore this question, I want to turn to a story told by Jelly Roll Morton. Morton arrived in St. Louis in 1912, headed for the sporting district, sat down at a piano, and got into a prolonged cutting contest, playing works by Joplin and other ragtime composers. A cutting contest was where musicians would try and outdo each other in showing off at the piano. Sometimes it was an actual formalised contest with prizes. Sometimes, as in this case, it was more of an informal testing out of what a new player could do. Partway through the cutting contest, the ragtime composer Artie Matthews man who had only played Bach, showed up and started to listen in. Matthews came over, put some sheet music on the piano and challenged Morton to play the scores he had given him, which were works by Giuseppe Verdi, Anton Vorjak, Friedrich von Flotto and Franz von Suppe. And Morton tells us that these tunes were easy to play because he already knew all of them off by heart. This story confirms that classical music is known to ragtime composers. And here we see that Jelly Roll Morton, one of the greatest of the early jazz musicians, is obviously familiar with classical music too. With this in mind, let me set out what I think is the relationship between ragtime, classic ragtime and jazz. First, in purely musical terms, I think we can be misled by the term classic ragtime. Ragtime is not classical music. Its conventions are too narrow. It is too schematic. This is not to deny that ragtime can be a great form of music. Joplin's genius is demonstrated precisely by his ability to create immortal tunes within these narrow confines. Second, although it may sound paradoxical, ragtime actually becomes a form of music that might be considered classical through its transformation into jazz. Jazz frees ragtime up, loosens its conventions, and that makes it, potentially at least, a form of classical music. Scott Joplin took a different route to the jazz pioneers. He took ragtime back to its folk roots in his second opera, Tree Monisher. An interview with Scott Joplin in the New York Age in April 1913 helps us to understand his thinking about his opera. There has been ragtime music in America ever since the Negro race has been here, Joplin is quoted as saying. But white people took no notice of it until about 20 years ago. Joplin then ties ragtime closely to black culture and claims it has much longer, deeper roots than the ragtime craze would suggest. Joplin goes on to defend ragtime music against the charge of vulgarity. A charge that he attributes to the uncouth words put to ragtime songs. If someone were to put vulgar words to a strain of one of Beethoven's beautiful symphonies, people would begin saying, I don't like Beethoven's symphonies. So it's the unwholesome words and not the ragtime melodies that many people hate. As the reference to Beethoven makes clear, Joplin greatly appreciates classical music, and he sees ragtime as a black folk art being demeaned by vulgarity. So, how is black music to develop? In Joplin's hands, it will take on the classical form of an opera, but a folk opera, using ragtime melodies, and with a libretto that uses black idiomatic speech, but without any of the vulgarity uh, that he dislikes. Well, that describes Tremonisher. 
After completing A Guest of Honour, Joplin immediately started work on this second opera. It took him around six years to write the libretto and set it to music. By this time, Joplin was living in New York. He had probably moved there expressly to try and get his opera up and running. However, despite all Joplin's efforts, no one would publish it. So, in 1911, Joplin took on the heavy cost of publishing Tree Monisher himself, as a vocal score with a piano accompaniment. Joplin now wanted to publish Tree Monisher with full orchestration, and, of course, he wanted to get it performed. But no one would run the financial risk of publishing what would be a huge orchestrated score. And no one would stage it either. So, Joplin became his own producer and director. We know this because there are references in newspapers to a few performances of the opera in New Jersey under the less baffling title of A Real Slow Drag, with Laura Moss in the role of Tree Monisher. There was one performance in New York City. Joplin organised and paid for his own performance in Harlem, hoping an impresario would then take, take it on. This performance is variously dated to 1911 and 1915, but everyone agrees that the performance was a flop. There were only 17 people in the audience. Well, what's the opera about? Treen Monisher is set in the countryside near Texarkana, where Joplin grew up, shortly after the abolition of slavery. In some sense, the setting seems idyllic for the characters in the opera, because the whites have vacated a cotton plantation, leaving the former slaves to work it for themselves. This idyll is reflected in many cheerful songs, like this one that begins with the sound of a horn blowing, and then the field workers singing. The horn is being blown by Aunt Dinah and signifies that the working day has come to an end. So, tired but happy, the farm workers return home for supper. But there is a threat to this happy community. There are conjurers leading them astray with their superstition, and there is little in the way of leadership being provided by Parson All Talk. Joplin, then, is not creating myth like Wagner, but rather suggesting that black people need to free themselves from myth. Whether these myths include Christianity as well as superstition is left a little vague, although it is notable that the libretto never mentions God, only the Creator. To leave the community out of superstition is the task of the heroine, the Tree Monisher. Tree Monisher is the name given to a foundling, but a foundling who will found a new black community. She has been discovered as a light-skinned baby under a tree, and has grown up with an education provided for her by a white woman. The educated Tree Monisher rejects superstition and all forms of irrationality. Tree Monisher sets herself against the conjurers, but the conjurers capture her, and she narrowly escapes a cruel death, a form of lynching at their hands. Tree Monisher is rescued, the conjurers are caught, and the community calls for revenge. But Tree Monisher rejects the path of violence and forgives the culprits. She is acclaimed as leader of the community, and under her leadership, they set out to make a fresh start in the world. The themes of the opera are akin to the political message of Booker T. Washington and George H. White, to move forward, black people should seek education and should work with white people of goodwill, seeking cooperation and integration. But what of Joplin's choice of a young woman as a heroine and as a leader? I think that this means most obviously that Joplin believes that men and women should be on an equal footing. That women have at least as much potential as men and they should be treated with respect. It follows that Joplin's opera is a complete rejection of the milieu in which he had lived the brothels of the sporting district, and the degradation of women that went with it. That world, in Joplin's view, was not in any sense the way forward for black people. And this also helps to explain Joplin's rejection of jazz, which was heavily implicated in this same sporting world. The failure of Tree Monisher to find an audience devastated Joplin and possibly contributed to his final illness. In 1916, he was committed to the Manhattan State Hospital where he died the following year. The piano and vocal score to Tree Marsha have survived, however, because, luckily for us, Joplin made the financially ruinous decision to publish them. Until 1962, four boxes of handwritten parts, rock, orchestra and stage directions also survived, first in the care of his wife, Lottie Joplin, and then in the care of various people disputing her estate after her death. In 1962, a lawyer tasked with overseeing this estate threw the boxes away. Had he kept them for a few more years, the Scott Joplin revival would have got underway and he would have realised how valuable those boxes were. Oh well, the piano score is enough. It has been orchestrated and the opera has been revived.
Country Monitor debuted on Broadway in 1975 to great acclaim, and it is now performed regularly throughout the United States. I hope you have enjoyed this story of how Samuel Coleridge Taylor's concert in Sunderland led to Scott Joplin becoming an opera composer, with a social and political vision for black people in America. I'll say goodbye now, and let Joplin's music play itself out. <laughs>